Let me begin by saying humanity is divided in all sorts of different ways, and one of the ways in which it's divided is between the Machiavellians and the Mistakers, those who assume that everything political is due to some diabolical plot somewhere or another, and those who assume that it's due to some almighty mistake in the bureaucratic apparatus. And I have to say that four years working for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and 30 years working for my university have put me firmly in the second camp. Most uh, uh, problems are caused by bureaucratic cock-ups, not by diabolical plots. Let's begin by British association <coughs> with this island from 1878. Britain took control of this island in 1878 from Turkey under the misapprehension that it would be a suitable place for a major naval base. They thought they needed a major naval base because they thought that Turkey was an incipient state of collapse, that they could assist Turkey in those circumstances against the advance of Russia. All of this was uh, based on misapprehensions. Turkey wasn't about to collapse at that stage. If it had have done, Britain hadn't got an army in 1878, which could have been sent to protect Turkey against Russia. Remember, this was the age when Bismarck used to joke that if the British army ever invaded Germany, he'd have it arrested by the police. <laughs> so, uh, all sorts of uh, mistakes underlining that policy at that time, although both Disraeli and Salisbury, our uh, delegates to the Congress of Berlin, which ratified the takeover of this island, uh, were always regarded as the great successors, success stories at the Congress. In fact, a few years later, we took over um, Egypt, and the focus of our attention moved to Egypt rather than to Cyprus. And when Gladstone came in as Prime Minister, he would have given uh, uh, Cyprus back to Turkey because uh, he believed that it wasn't worth holding. And there are many, many other examples where British policy in this region has been based on insufficient information about the people living in the region. Of course, the most egregious example is the Balfour Declaration which led to the emergence of the State of Israel. And, of course, the typical obfuscation of language used in the Balfour Declaration, which talked about setting up a national homeland for the Jews in historic Palestine. I was at a conference like this in Israel about four years ago, and it was a conference of historians. And we had all these various academic presentations, and then the conference <coughs> organizers put on a tour of Jerusalem. Wonderful, and we had a very attractive young Israeli guide. Here we are, 30 old men, old historians, uh, gazing at this young guide who was standing in front of one of the gates of Jerusalem. And she said, well, I'll just give you a rundown on the history of why uh, Israel is here. And Arthur Balfour, as you all know, promised a state of Israel uh, in this part of the world. And 30 hands went up from the historians, and they said, um, or our spokesman said, uh, no, of course, in fact, Balfour promised a homeland, not a state of Israel, and he also promised that nothing would be done to disadvantage the existing inhabitants of historic Palestine. But, of course, in a sense, the young lady was right. The obfuscation didn't work. The Jews imagined that we were talking about setting up a state, and indeed the Palestinians were also extremely suspicious of that. There were many other mistakes based on uh, equally uh, fallacious information. Another, of course, which we all know about was the Suez operation. The only thing I will say in parenthesis about that, and it's a point I will come back to from time to time, is that in studying for that recent book that I've just written, what struck me about it for the first time was how much more sensible 
the opinion of the ordinary British man in the street was than the opi opinion of the Eden government. The uh, public accepted Eden's opinion that NASA was wrong to grab hold of the Suez Canal, but it never supported the use of force against Egypt at that time. It was, in fact, streaks ahead of the government in its common sense approach to the problem. Only too often, British policy has made mistakes, and it's had to be dug out of its mistakes, or British governments have made mistakes, and it's, they've had to be dug out of those mistakes by their representatives on the spot in the Middle East. People like Percy Sykes, John Glove, Arnold Wilson, and so on, in the 1920s, and of course the members of the armed forces. And that brings me to events since March 2003. I was, um, admittedly, I was influenced in writing this paper. I'd just been reading Bob Woodward's book, um, Plan of Attack, on what went on before the attack on Iraq in 2003. But it struck me as astonishing that the British and Americans could be committed to that war in the way that they actually were in those circumstances by a tiny group of people who were not well informed about the situation in the Middle East and, to my way of thinking, hadn't fundamentally understood the intrinsic problem that we're facing in that part of the world. What is the intrinsic problem? Well, first of all, it's that the politicization, the politicization of the masses, which was affecting the Balkans in the 1870s and led to their independence from <laughs> Turkey, has now spread to the whole Middle Eastern world. There, and that has preceded the development of sound political institutions. And where politicization precedes institutions, you always have great difficulties in achieving political stability. So that's the first problem they face in this present of crisis, as our conveners have called it. The second problem that uh, we face in this area is that it is much more <coughs> difficult for an authoritarian religion to make the transition to democracy. Democracy as such was no doubt invented in Greece, but modern democracy has spread from Protestant Northern Europe out like ink being poured onto a piece of blotting paper. And every time it has encountered an area where you have had historically an authoritarian religion, the transition to democratic institutions has been extremely bumpy. And you can see this in Spain in the 1930s with the Civil War and then the Franco period. You can see it in uh, Italy with Mussolini and the whole difficulty of transitioning to democracy of the sort that we have in Italy today. Um, and you can see it in uh, Russia, the Soviet Union. Democratization is much more difficult if you're dealing with a people uh, who rely totally on the book, uh, 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 a sacred book, for their guidance. And it's a point I will come back to later on. And thirdly, there is a fundamental problem which has already been touched on this morning, which is that when they gained independence, the countries of the Middle East initially turned in a Western direction. In other words, their primary aim, often through socialism, was to uh, develop their economies and improve the condition of their people. This uh, uh, laudable attempt has on the whole been, or in many areas, been a failure. The Middle Eastern countries have not grown uh, uh, sufficiently to uh, manage the growth of their populations, and therefore this has, turned, this has caused a turning away from the Western models of development. What is the consequence of that? 
Well, they turn to other alternatives, and of course the, is the Iranian Revolution, the real revolution which took place in Iran in 1979, was the first real indicator of what was going to happen there in that part of the world. And uh, this, as we all know, has spread through Islamist movements in many parts of the Muslim area. I'm not an expert on this part of the world. Most of my academic career has been writing about the beginning and end of wars or about East Asia. And I'm fascinated by the way in which the integration of Japan into the Western world went through many of the similar processes which the Muslim world is going through today. Now I'm a card-carrying member of the intellectual community. But intellectuals are the most fickle members of society. And what happened in Japan, and what has to some extent happened uh, across the Middle East today, uh, is that you have intellectuals in these transitional countries who become I, I, idealistic um, admirers of the foreign country, uh, whatever that country may be. Many Japanese in the period around 1900, Japanese intellectuals, fell in love with the United States and with Western Europe. Then they went to the United States or Western Europe, and they found that it wasn't this perfect community that they imagined a perfectly working democracy of uh, Christian values, etc., etc. What they then did was to go home, and they did this in all zigzag, where they became the great enemies of westernization in Japan. There's a very good book on this subject. Somebody mentioned the love-hate relationship between colonial countries and their uh, former colonizers. But there was, there's a very good book on Japan called Japan's Love-Hate Relationship with the West. And it describes exactly that process. And that, of course, uh, has very much influ influenced the Islamist movement in Egypt and elsewhere. It's when Kut, I can't pronounce his name very well, I apologize, uh, went to the United States and saw what the United States was really like, that he then went back to Egypt, turned against um, uh, Western values, and preached Islamism, and uh, uh, everything has developed from there. So when we went into Iraq in March 2003, much of this uh, didn't seem to me to have been understood in the United States. And on top of that, uh, it didn't, the Americans didn't take sufficient account of the military effects of politicization. Politicization leads to guerrilla warfare if uh, the circumstances are right. Compare the British takeover of Cyprus in 1878 and the ease with which the British did it with what happened here in the 1950s and the little difficulties the British had uh, in Cyprus with Aoka. Once you have a politicized population, they're not going to put up with outsiders uh, coming in, intervening in ways that they don't want to. Now the United States is by far the most powerful country militarily in the world if you're having conventional wars. But it needs to play to its strengths, not its weaknesses, to involve themselves in two prolonged guerrilla wars, insurgencies, was an egregious mistake. And the power of insurgency has increased, first of all, because of the development of suicide bombers, beginning in Sri Lanka and spreading out into the Middle East, which makes the insurgents much more powerful, and thirdly, with the development which we all saw epitomized on 9-11. Now, of course, from time to time, insurgencies had uh, retaliated against the metropolis uh, when they were engaged in a campaign against the metropolis. But these were isolated incidents. 
Now we're going to have to face the fact that insurgents are going to attack the metropolis if you become involved in an intrusion in their territories. And that reverses the whole uh, situation. The last two main British defense reviews, the one under the Tories and the immediate first one uh, under the Labour government, were uh, based on the premise that we should go out to other countries, we should intervene, and we should stabilize other countries when they are in danger of stabilization. Now, British defenses against Islamist terrorists at home have been uh, remarkably successful up to now on Touchwood, and uh, there are always dangers in saying these things. But the police and the intelligence services have wrapped up most of the Islamist attacks, and Kirchhoff talked uh, just now about the most recent ones, the plans to uh, blow up the airliners over the Atlantic. And this is part of wave after wave of Islamist attacks on Britain that have occurred over the last few years. And you can contrast the defensive successes of the police and the intelligence services with the mess that we've got ourselves in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So what am I saying in sum? I'm not saying that military power based in Cyprus or anywhere else is useless. What I am saying is that it has to be used with immense care, particularly in modern circumstances in this area of the world. What you've got uh, in the Islamic world at the moment is something somewhat akin to the Reformation. It's a massive struggle between the uh, progressives and the Islamists for the heart of Islam. And when you take any step in this part of the world, you have to be extremely careful about the consequences. And you have to take advice from experts on the region. Let me give you just one example which came up a week ago. Uh, President Obama, as you know, made a speech about the Middle East in which he hoped to put the United, or change the United States image from the, that, that it had acquired during the Bush years. And he made so, all sorts of concessions to the Islamic world. But amongst the things he said, was that he would, quote, go to court to protect the rights of women and girls to wear the hijab and punish those who deny it. Now, when he said this, he caused outrage amongst the liberals in the Islamic world who attacked uh, him for saying that and also attacked him for appointing the Muslim American writer Daya Magahed as his uh, um, one of his advisors on the Islamic world. One of the uh, writers, uh, liberal writers, a Yemeni journalist called Elham Mani, again I apologize for my pronunciation, said, sisters, let's use our intelligence. Those who, wear the, who defend the wearing of the hijab wish to conceal the feminine side of women so as to avoid arousing desire in men, whose urges they believe bring them to disaster. Even if we accept this bestial perception of human beings, logic dictates that it doesn't apply to little girls. Girls are not marriageable women. I asked you to keep uh, to yourselves the opinion of various clerics regarding the permissibility of child marriages, because these opinions are shameful, despicable, and humiliating, um, uh, and so on and so forth. What I'm, what I'm saying is that Obama got himself mixed up in this bitter argument between the progressives and the conservatives in that part of the world. And whenever you take a, a decision about what you're going to say, it evokes all sorts of difficulties. So let me come to a conclusion. What should our policy be in that part of the world? If we do have to use force, we should use it with great care. We should be made absolutely certain that we're not going to become involved in the sorts of insurgencies which we have been involved in uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
And we could have told beforehand that it was very likely if we intruded in those countries that this is precisely what would happen. So we've got to be much more careful about that. We've got to be much more sensitive about the battle of ideas which is going on in that part of the world and the sort of part that we can play in that uh, conflict. And thirdly, we've got to be true to our own ideals that Kirchhoff was talking about, the ideals of democracy and constitutional government. We cannot allow ourselves to be pushed into infringing international law by the use of torture, by the use of uh, rendition and other actions. If we do that, we abandon our most core values. And it is precisely those core values that we must uh, 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 maintain at all times. Let me finish by giving you one or two other quotations. This is a typically Islamist view of the situation which we've got ourselves in in Iraq and Afghanistan. We say to the West, which does not act reasonably and does not learn its lessons, by Allah you will be defeated. You will be defeated in Palestine, and your defeat there has already begun. America will be defeated in Iraq. Wherever the Islamic nation is targeted, its enemies will be defeated, Allah willing. Tomorrow our nation will sit on the throne of the world. This is not a figment of imagination, but a fact. The Arabs have said, we don't want conventional wars. Of course they don't want conventional wars because the United States is by far the most powerful country in the world. Thank you very much. Leave the war to the peoples. Today the Israeli weapons are of no use against the peoples. We have imposed a new equation in the war. In this equation our tools are stronger. That's why we will defeat them, Allah willing. That is their interpretation. And that is an interpretation which I uh, fundamentally agree with. We don't want to fight uh, against insurgents. We must in avoid that sort of conflict. And I, would, I quote in my paper the British strategist J.F. C. Fuller, Major General J.F. C. Fuller, who, in, who wrote in 1932, the materialistic conception of fighting force must undergo a dramatic, drastic change if force is to maintain internal tranquility and frustrate external pressure. It's not physical force itself which is wrong, but physical force applied to conditions which it cannot rectify. Physical force is but one of several means of protecting national existence. We're involved in a battle of ideas, and it's that which we must win, not concentrate on the physical side of it and in military. Thank you. Uh...